All right, welcome to the High Rise, where we talk about cannabis, MSOs, products, and market analysis. It's a laid back and data back discussion on all things cannabis. My name is Cy Scott. I'm the CEO and co founder of Headset, and I'm here with Emily Paxia. Hi, I'm Emily Paxia, and just like the show, I would say I'm laid back, but also data backed. <laughs> Awesome. And I'm here with Matt Carnes as well. Hello. Hello from New York. Good to be here. All right. So today we've got uh, a number of things to cover. Um, some Canada news as well as some US MSO news um, just to kind of review. The first thing I think we want to talk about is in Canada, kind of some US CBD strategy. Um, recently, we talked about Canopy and Southern Glazers uh, announcement, where Southern Glazers will be distributing their Quattro uh, CBD beverage, uh, which is pretty interesting. Southern Gra- Glazers actually also distributes cannabis products in Canada, uh, obviously the largest alcohol uh, distributor in the US. So that's a, you know, a unique kind of outlet uh, for a Canopy growth to kind of come to the US. But more recently, uh, just this week, we saw Valens acquires Green Roads. Um, and with Green Roads, uh, you know, this is the number two CBD brand, according to the press release. Uh, they acquired this company for $40 million, which is uh, 1.8x uh, 2020 EBITDA. So, you know, just kind of another CBD strategy coming from a Canadian operator. This one's a little different than the distribution uh, play with Southern Glazers. Kind of sounds like Tilray Manitoba Harvest. I know Manitoba Harvest has a footprint with some CBD products, some tinctures. I don't know if those products are actually sold in the U.S. I do know some of their hemp-based products, um, like their hemp milk is sold in the U.S. So how do we feel about that? Is this a good strategy? Is this the only way that can Canadian operators can come into the U.S. to build a brand? Is it a good revenue opportunity? Is it something else? Yeah, um, I'll just jump in. I mean, it feels to me like the Canadian operators are just continuing to look at any way they can possibly start to get a toehold into the U.S. as the U.S. market continues to just prove to be so healthy and growing, especially on the cannabis side. But I think it's important for investors to understand and people to understand that cannabis markets and CBD markets are in completely different um, animals and that they function differently. They sell through different points of sale and they have different regulatory frameworks that kind of either create moats around the growth of the business and protection of the business or create opportunity to scale massively. Um, I do think it's interesting that this, they said it's the number two brand in the United States because that would mean there's a pretty big difference between where they sit and where like Charlotte's Web or CW Hemp sits, which I believe came in around $100 million in top line revenue for 2020. And the other thing to note is I would dig in to understand the EBITDA around that because a lot of these uh, CBD companies really struggle to drive any EBITDA if if any at all. And just because the margins are really, really tight in the US and the pricing, they're trying to command pretty high prices for the products, but I don't think they can really quite get there to drive the margins they need. Um, And just one last thought on the Manitoba Harvest. Um, We were actually investors in Manitoba Harvest way back in like 2014 through, um, I think, or 2015 through Compass Diversified Holdings, which was a diversified hold co. Um, They were very bullish on the future of nutritional hemp. And so that was how they participated we were very bullish on it too. Um, I'm also a plant-based eater. So for me, I use um, nutritional or yeah, nutritional hemp instead of soy if I can for protein and fiber. But um, I don't know, it just feels it's a very different, it's a very different category. It grows very differently than cannabis. And so even though it's from technically kind of the same plant, it's a very different business model. So it's it's important for people to dig in and, and understand the growth patterns around that and also understand that Manitoba Harvest has been around for quite a long time. So it may have a different uh, growth trajectory than these high growth uh, consumer pa- or cannabis packaged goods, as you reference them, Cy, um, on the cannabis side. So it's just, it's not all, all the same. One thing um, also to kind of complement um the Canadian interest, um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe Clever Leaves has a play into the CBD market in the U.S. as well. Um, so there is sort of a, a heightened level of interest, I think, around the CBD. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure it's obviously going to be very big worldwide, uh, but it would be interesting because in, um, well, by and large, everything in, in South America is is produced a lot less expensively than uh, 
than in Canada. So I would put my bet on the South Americans uh, um, and the opportunities that they'll be able to come up with versus the Canadians where things are much more expensive. Yeah, fantastic. And I, I feel like we'll see more news like this ahead um, as the Canadian operators, you know, the Canada growth has been relatively slow for traditional cannabis products and getting U.S. exposure is pretty important. And the sooner they can do it, the better. So this does seem to be you know, one of a, a few different plays that they can make. So in other Canada news, uh, Sundial upped their investment in a joint venture to invest in strategic financial and operational partnerships, targeting asymmetrically enhanced risk return opportunities in the cannabis industry to provide exposure to a portfolio of attractive debt, equity, and hybrid investments. Oh my gosh, that was, that was a, a mouthful. Um, so, <laughs> you know, if, if for those that remember Sundial, um, you know, may have been kind of one of these Wall Street bet stocks uh, for a moment. You know, for, if we all remember uh, the, the GameStop um, craze and uh, they brought in a lot of capital and it seems like they're putting this capital to work. And this is another interesting strategy, I think. Right. Put this money into a JV, make some investments in some companies of a variety of different companies that are asymmetrically enhanced, as they say. So, um you know, is this something else? Will we see more capital being put to work like this, uh, this model that Sundial's uh, coming out with? I would just say broadly, um, I can't help the pun, it's coming, but joint ventures in the cannabis industry are probably going to be um, more significant as time goes on, especially as companies are, everybody's dealing with interstate commerce and, and so forth. Um, but I couldn't help the pun, so sorry. <laughs> I know I Matt when you wanted to call this podcast I was like no honey <laughs> I can't help it um yeah no I I mean I think it's look they had a they went public it wasn't a great reception in the public markets it's been a tough fall for them they've had some recalls it's it's not been a straight line up like some of the other well none of these companies have been a straight line it's a it's a tough road to hoe and so I think that um they raised money during a crazy cycle, thanks to Wall Street bets and the people who jumped in on that. And I think they're trying to now bolster their business by buying revenue, by buying companies that contribute positively to the business. And um, if you can't build it, buy it. I don't know. They have the access to the cash. Yeah. Who would you buy for 180? If you had $180 million, what do you guys think? Would you buy technology, ancillary type company? Would you buy... Another plant touching company, a U.S. CBD company, all of the above. That's a really good question, and there are a lot of variables. Um, I would say at this juncture, I would invest in some type of business that could also serve in other industries, not just be limited to cannabis. Oh, so like uh, the Sweetwater by Afria. Um, pathogen, the, the lab testing where they're doing like the testing for, you know, all kinds of other different attributes in, in agriculture other than cannabis. I don't know too much about the company, but generally speaking, I think they're, they would be able to serve outside of cannabis. But I mean, obviously, we're still at such an early stage that, you know, depending on the state and the market, um, plant touching businesses would be really attractive. It just really, I would have to see, you know, a lot of things. Well, if, are, are you saying if I was a Canadian operator, who would I buy, Cy? I don't know if you're, if you're a sundial or you're, you, you know, you run this JV, right. And you need to make some, uh, investments where you got almost $200 million to spend. Yeah. Get I would invest checkbook. into a, yeah, I would invest into a Latin American operator that's vertically integrated or GMP certified and, flip my manufacturing business into that region and completely improve my cost structure and, and then distribute internationally as well as into Canada. So that's what I would do. In not other bad. words, I would not be growing and manufacturing cannabis in Canada. Right. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. So who would do that? I would, I would invest into Mexico or Colombia or Portugal and, and flip the whole script on it. Take that money and, and get more bang for it. I love it. Sundial, when you need some help, uh, give us a ring. We're, we're here for you. You know who to call. 
So on to U.S. and MSO news. Busy week uh, in the news, as always. Um, you know, first, Columbia Care. Uh, they made an investment uh, into a new greenhouse in New York, a $42 million purchase. I feel a bit of an echo from, again, the early days of Canada when everyone was uh, buying up greenhouses. Um, you know, this pretty recently, uh, Canopy Growth made some headlines around shuttering one of their uh, greenhouses that they acquired in British Columbia, 3 million square feet. This one with Columbia Care is 1 million square feet, so three times the size in, in BC, which they had bought for 500 million Canadian uh, and uh, divested for 40 million Canadian, which, you know, is just a, a little cheaper than, um, you know, what Columbia Care is buying in New York. So to me, you know, this, you know, I, Feels a little like deja vu in a way, right? Uh, emerging market, New York. Uh, the legalization framework hasn't really been laid out. You know, when a lot of these investments were made in, in grows in Canada, um, we didn't really know what Canada was going to look like. We didn't really know what the framework was going to look like, but people were gearing up. Um, and, you know, this is happening in New York, but I do have to believe that New York is going to be a very sizable market. And New York, you know, has um, a lot of other U.S. markets to look to to kind of roll it out effectively. But is this, um, you know, a sign of things to come for New York? Are we going to see more investments like this? Last week, we talked a bit about Pennsylvania. We talked about a quarter of a billion dollars going into Pennsylvania. Not all of that was in, in grow, but a lot of it was in infrastructure. Um, and do we think there's going to be a big uh, race to see how much square footage you can get in New York in preparation for adult use legalization? You see, this is, I'm sorry, uh, I was just going to say, this is the thing. You know, at, at this juncture, I think companies have to be very mindful of when the tide is going to turn and when interstate commerce will be permissible. So, you know, does it make sense in New York to just like overspend and build, build, build uh, when perhaps, you know, from what I understand, there's a, um, a cooperative agreement in the works, perhaps in between New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. I think all those kind of things have to be figured out. Um, before, you know, anybody really pulls the trigger hard. But like this is also on the heels, don't forget, if I recall correctly, um, GTI um, is going to convert a prison into a grow facility. I, I can't remember um, the square footage, but, you know, there's there's also a lot of capacity, you know, in the Northeast. There's um, ACAN. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them. They have like a huge indoor cultivation facility. You know, what's going to happen to that? You know, will that be utilized somehow? And I don't know. I just think there's a lot of things to kind of a lot of moving parts. And this is where it gets exciting because I think this is what's going to differentiate uh, the real winners from the not so much of a winner situation. Uh, the be to be able to navigate through these challenges and these like obstacles and these like uncertainties. Yeah, I mean, I'm a bull on New York. I think that every market that's open so far has been um, undersupplied. Almost every market has been undersupplied. And I think the infrastructure that exists in New York is not going to sustain and or even meet the even remotely the demands of of the consumers in that in that state. I don't think this all happens, by the way, until latter half of 22, beginning of 23. So um, I'd see we're going to have a slow rollout of this and it'll be heavily medical until then, which is, uh, does, I mean, I don't know if we've ever bought uh, cannabis in New York state, but it's pretty atrocious in the, in the legal market. But uh, I, I come from California. We have access to the, the best. But, um, you know, I think that, well, I actually come from Buffalo, New York, which is why I think New York matters to me so much. So I have a bit of a different opinion on it. I do think that it's for Columbia Care, I will say, has had early flags in New York. And so they've gone through this long process to get to this point where adult use happens. I used to run by their store in an amazing location in Brooklyn on my way to Soul Cycle in the morning when I lived in Fort Greene a couple of summers ago. And I was always like, oh man, that's going to be such a cool store when when this all opens up. But I mean, the amount of foot traffic walking past that store at any time of the day, all I can think about is that greenhouse is going to be very well utilized to feed through their entire supply chain to even just fill, honest to God, that store alone, I think will do an enormous amount of business. And when you look at the people, the um, the population per door that exists in this market already, it's going to be the highest number of people per door in the country by a long shot. And so 
I think this market's going to be a beast, and I think we need more infrastructure on the on the cultivation and manufacturing side to supply it, at least in the short term. And then, you know, interstate commerce constantly is coming up. It's always a fear, and we have to think about how we divest of assets or consolidate our assets as we're investing into these operators. But let's not forget that one of the biggest motivators for why these markets are being are becoming legal is the tax money and job creation. And having grown up in Western and upstate New York, I can tell you that job creation is an essential aspect of that part of the state. It's been kind of a rust belt situation. And um, a lot of industry is pulled out uh, for a number of reasons. But if cannabis can revive that, just like I saw it revive a town in Western Mass and Athol with Ascend, I mean, I'd be so happy to see that. And I'd also be happy to see the constituents of New York actually have access to good cannabis. So um, I'm pretty I'm pretty bullish on at least the near term building of it. Now, Sai, that you raised a great point about um, the Canadian build out of infrastructure. And it it would at the beginning it was necessary. Like I remember we were early investors in Afria and they were having trouble. Uh, meeting the demands of the market. Um, and that was a problem across the board. And that's why investor, but you, but this is where, when you're paying attention to how invest in or think about this industry, you have, have to pay attention to what's happening next. And to your point, I mean, at one point, Morgan was like, I think there's enough infrastructure in Canada for every man, woman, woman <laughs> and child to smoke weed all day, every day. And they would still have too much supply. And I think we've seen kind of it flip on its head uh, up there. But so it's just going to take prudence and, and mindfulness of the operators as they continue to try to look at the, you know, the push and pull of supply and demand on these things. Totally, totally. Well, time will tell. Well, speaking of investments, uh, another investment, uh, we saw Red, White & Bloom uh, invest into Florida by purchasing some assets from Acreage for $60 million. Uh, the purchase, I believe, was some land uh, cultivation facility, uh, and I don't think it nearly as big as what um, what uh, Columbia Care bought in New York, um, but still, you know, cultivation and some admin office buildings. Um, you know, what's interesting here to me is, you know, you see, um, you know, Acreage, which was also an early, early mover, big name. And uh, I feel like we're talking about Canopy a lot, uh, Canopy Growth a lot in this uh, in this conversation. But, you know, Canopy Growth and Acreage made some headlines uh, around um, a pretty unique structure um, on what would happen post-legalization in the U.S. and a way for Canopy to go beyond their Southern Glazers deal and really, you know, create a footprint in the U.S. Uh, should legalization happen um, with acreage. And here we see acreage retrenching and moving back to what they consider to be, you know, their their primary focus areas of the Northeast and Midwest, um, you know, where they're, I guess, more capital efficient. It's interesting to me. I feel like Florida is a growing market, um, going to be. A large, it is a large market now. Could very well be a similar New York model at one point. Um, what do we think here? Is Acreage uh, just uh, going to do much better by focusing? Are they losing some advantages they may have uh, in Florida um, by being there? Is Red, White, and Bloom jumping in the right way to you know what may be an exciting market? Uh, I, I well, I would say you know it's interesting because. You know, we have a changing of the guard in um, at Acreage, right? We pretty much have a new management team. So, you know, you like to think that they're sitting and they're thinking about their strategy long and hard and what worked before and what they think will work now. Um, you know, Florida is a is a um, you know is an attractive uh, market. Um, I just wonder, you know, with the shift in strategy. Um, what does that do for the valuation of acreage? And then what does that do? I, I'm not, I don't recall the terms of the agreement with Canopy, but would there be, you know, we'll, they'll obviously have to pay less than if they're shrinking and they're not, you know, their valuation goes down. I think there were minimums in the deal. There's like, it was like two share classes that they did where like there's a fixed shares, um, 70% of acreage. Canopy is obligated to buy I think at 0.3 times um, canopy share price, uh, something like that. And then 30% on these floating shares, which was uh, $6.42, um, which I think is the floor on that. Um, and there's like a higher uh, on some weighted average price or something. But anyways, you're, you're absolutely right. Like, what does this mean, right? I mean, obviously their share price has moved. I think... Um, 
from what I remember, the fixed shares is what everyone's trading. Uh, I think retail traders really haven't touched the floating shares. I think people say, well, 70%, you know, the canopy's on the hook to buy this should we see federal legalization. But you still see, you know, movement there. And was this a good thing or a bad thing for, for, um, for acreage, but obviously, you know, we're not in that boardroom. We don't have, you know, the same information, and hopefully they're, they're making the yeah. right choice. But it will be interesting it, to see red, white, and blue coming in. Because it's interesting because they have a guy from Pfizer who's, you know, so to me that's like going down the medical lane, pharma lane. Um, but I don't know. Pfizer at acreage? Yeah. Or at red, white, and blue? Oh, okay. No, yeah, at acreage. Got it, got it. Uh, I mean, Acreage has always been better at uh, window dressing on their board than they've been at execution in their assets. So, I mean, John Boehner took a $20 million check and walked away and the investors took a bath. And, you know, now he has a book out talking about his experiences in the industry. I can't How to make $20 million quickly. Yes, exactly. And not create any value. Um, and and also to just let racist institutions remain in place. But, you know, I think that, um, yeah. Sounds I don't like know. a I, good, good read. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've read that book before. It's called Life. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I don't really have much to say other than I think uh, they're, they've always been about the press release. It's kind of like Monopoly where they've got a bunch of stuff on the board, but it doesn't have any depth or like actual value to it. So I've always been amazed by the way money has flown in this in this space. And, and that's one of those uh, enigmas to me. I'll, I won't really ever understand the attraction to it and why. But I just think it's about window dressing and like people move in and um you know, they move in herds and they're like, oh, those people are just like me or I want to be like them. And then I go and put my money there. So we didn't. Especially <laughs> early on. You know, when you didn't, said no one really, you know <laughs> particularly early on when there was only just a couple of people at the table, like you really, I don't know, everybody was so excited. Oh, let me, I'll have what he's having or whatever. And not really understanding yes. or thinking through, you know, what everything's going to look like, you know, five years, seven years, ten, whatever. So, yeah. You know, there's a there's a uh, an analog to that, and it's called Theranos. And um, it's you know there was a whole book about um, following wind window dressing into deals. And um, that and is a good that, book, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Bad Blood, definitely a good read. Um, but yeah, so that's well. Yeah, speaking of window dressing or not, hopefully not. Uh, Cresco announced a new board member. Um, and uh, one of their founder board members retired. Um, I believe it's uh, Tarek Brooks, and I uh, may be mispronouncing that, but uh, what's really compelling is that he was the COO of account management trading at Bridgewater. And uh, for those that may know Bridgewater, the largest hedge fund, Ray Dalio, uh, who also wrote a book. Um, but I mean, it's a, a serious firm, right? Um, Bridgewater, big name. But not only Bridgewater, He's also uh, tasked with overseeing all business operations and investments owned by the one and only Sean Diddy Combs. So kind of uh, quite a quite a spread there. But uh, sounds like, uh, you know, on paper, I mean, a real fantastic get for for Cresco, right? Cresco's losing one of their founders. And I believe this founder um, from the board and this founder, we had some background in real estate and maybe, you know, the real estate stuff was probably very important day one. Now it's, you know, brands and developing that and, you know, kind of having this lens to uh, Sean Diddy Combs brands, uh, which include spirits. So, you know, obviously overlap there with beverage, alcohol and cannabis, um, you know, media, music and consumer packaged goods of all things. So, um, you know, it sounds like a pretty good get and uh, probably, you know, much better than someone like a John Boehner, um, you know, coming in. Uh, so I'm optimistic with this, but you know, the question is, is this going to be a new trend? Is this going to be like a competitive advantage? Is it going to strategy, you know, who can attract who, who can have, you know, top, top tier names or really, um, maybe if not well-known names, at least people with real diverse backgrounds that, uh, can kind of fill in some of, you know, what's to be the future strategy of companies like Cresco. I mean, I'll just share that on the boards that I'm on, we've, we've worked really hard to try to attract people who have analog experience that they can apply to our industry. So maybe it's around manufacturing, distribution products. Um, so it does, I think it does help. Um, I will say like, for example, one of the companies I'm on, there will be an announcement. We attracted a really interesting 
board candidate. And I really respected the way he went through the process because he was not, um, I'm st- I would say he was certainly not in the I'm pro cannabis camp in terms of his, he had a lot of questions about what it means to participate in this industry. And I, I respect that process of like getting yourself truly comfortable with it, not just that you're jumping in for a quick uh, return on your time, which is crazy, but um, the way it, some of that gets proportionally paid out. But I think that, you know, attracting good talent from analog industries is a good way for us to continue to round out what this industry looks like. Um, we certainly need more diversity. That's definitely true. But but I think um, I think we'll be seeing more of it. But I, I don't think I would just say that that's just a check the box for why to invest into a company, because I'd want to know that that person really spent the time looking at the company to make a really true decision around it. Like this person, he actually gave up give, taking, a, he's very careful about how many boards he sits on because he wants to truly contribute time. And I thought that was also a really respectable aspect of his consideration set. So um, I think it's important to think about board composition and try to attract interesting people to bring new perspectives. Absolutely. So uh, last bit of news here. Um, as far as MSOs go, Ascend. Ascend is going public. I uh, made the announcement um, this week. Ascend you know, has a, a broad retail footprint in a number of states, Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, Massachusetts, and uh, I believe New Jersey. Um, and now they're going to be publicly traded uh, soon. So, um, yeah, how do we... It's a pretty big headline. Um, you know, recently they made some headlines. They brought in Lowell Farms uh, as, a, as a brand license. Um, so that was, I think, a couple weeks back we were talking about Ascend. Uh, so now here we are talking about public. So how do we feel about that? What's it going to look like? Uh, when, when do we expect everything to happen? Well, I can tell you this. I, am, <laughs> I think it's great that they got MedMen in New York right out of the gate, you know, pretty much. And then that's number one. I don't know Abner Curtin. I've listened to him speak. He's very impressive. I don't know him from a hole in the wall, but when I listen to him speak, I'm very inspired. So um, I could tell you that I'm pretty bullish um, on Ascend. And well, the thing is too, is like, this is another example, right? This is another winner, right? That's emerging, boom, done. Like I, I you know, I, I'm saying this, but uh, obviously I haven't gone through all the filings and everything, but it, it just seems to me on the surface um, that from what I know of the company, they're making a lot of small, uh, smart moves along the way. And, you know, New York is a big thing. New York is a big thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think so just maybe more next week, we'll talk about this more. But this week, what I'll say is they went, uh, they went the extra mile in their process to go public. So instead of just doing an RTO or reverse takeover, which is a lot of what other groups have have done, and they didn't really maybe even have the option to go another way. But um, Ascend chose to do both a gap and an IFRS audit. Um, of their financials, and they chose to also do a full U.S. prospectus, which you can now find because it's filed, and um, with a Canadian wrapper. So they'll be listed, and not like a Canadian, like, P. Diddy rapper. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, have you guys ever heard reggae? You're talking about Drake? Like, Is that code for Drake? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they did it so that they could be as prepared as possible for when, you know, uplisting is possible to the exchanges. So they're trying to run this like that, you know, like let's be prepared for that moment. But I'm very excited for this to start trading. I think it's a great MSO with a lot of really solid assets. Um, But yeah, I think we'll keep an eye out because it's, it's going live next week. So next week, maybe we can um, see. Yeah. We'll be able to cover more of that. All right. Well, I can't wait. All right. And uh, last but not least, and not, not a bit of news, Matt, you published a recent uh, kind of post-420 analysis uh, kind of covering some of the MSOs there and uh, where they're trading at. Um, well, it's what, Q420, what's, what's the... actually. I right, believe, right. But call, you know. use that pun. Um, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, to be clear, I should, I should be clear, yeah. Uh, well, how, first, how do people find the report? And then what are, the, uh, what are some of the, the big highlights? Sure. Well, uh, you can get this. Um, it's in my blog post of the Greenway, ugh, the Greenway Buzz, and it's at GreenwayAdvisors.com. And one of the things I wanted to do, um, because there's a lot of noise around GAP and IFRS, and this is another reason why I think Ascend is is awesome, because they had the thought to 
you know, file under both because it's very confusing. So the big difference between the IFRS and the GAAP is accounting for biological assets, which is on many levels just ridiculous, but I don't want to get into it now because people might want to tune off. Um, but bottom line is it's very confusing, right? It's even confusing for me and I'm a friggin' accountant. So I really rolled up my sleeves and I crunched the numbers, thought about it. And really what's important is cash, right? Cash is king. So stripping out all the, you know, accounting stuff, what, how much cash are these companies generating? And take, you know, so what I looked at is the cash flow from operations. I got rid of or, or added back the cash taxes that were paid from the prior year. So you kind of normalize the cash flow. And then it's like, then there's a provision for the current year. So is there enough cash on hand um, that the end, that the business is generating on its own to pay this enormous tax. There's a very high cost of prohibition, right? It's not only the um, taxes, the 280E, there's an added compliance cost. There's added the cost of debt that's not deductible. There's like the list goes on and on and on and on and on, right? So um, those companies out of the gate, there's two for both years that I looked at because now we have two years of audited financial statements. So TrueLeave and GTI, you know, both years they were able to generate enough cash to pay their taxes. To me, that's a big deal in this industry, in addition to paying all the other costs of prohibition. And then, um, you know, so I, I kind of lay all this out. Um, one of the other things uh, I looked at, and that, well, also I looked at the, really try to determine what the effect, the tax rate is on the cash. And some of these companies have paid up to 80%. 80% of their cash flow goes to taxes. So those guys that aren't pay, don't have that money effectively, they have to borrow money or raise capital just to pay their taxes effectively, right? And some of these have done this for two years. So the trajectory for everybody, every, you know, there's improvement from 2000 to 2019 and 2020. We'll see how this year plays out. But what I would say to that is the good news is for those stronger players, that gives them the opportunity to buy assets at distressed levels because I don't think the industry the way it is right now, and it might be two years before 280 goes away, I have no idea, but the longer it goes on, the weaker, the weaker, the smaller become, and the better opportunities are going to be there for the stronger players because they'll be able to buy these assets at distressed levels. One good example, MedMen. $56 million on their books they owe the IRS, $56 million. And they had like $6 million in cash. And so what did Ascend do? They went in and they got them. That was probably one of the considerations is not having enough cash, uh, you know, on Medman's part. I don't know, I'm just I'm just thinking, if, you know, just analyzing. Uh, so that that's, you know, gonna be interesting to see what happens. Obviously, we've all talked about consolidation. As consolidation continues, that's going to cause variations in margins and earnings volatility. And I think, you know, investors should not be surprised and don't freak out and sell your stock because one quarter, one acquisition wasn't integrated. Like you have to think longer term. That's how I look at it. And then I would also say, like when I look at comparative analysis, we're talking about Canada, um, the U.S. obviously, we all talk about it trades at a discount, sharp discount to the Canadian LPs. But one other thing. Um, is when I look at a theoretical uh, enterprise value of the industry, and that's based, it's a, it's a extrapolation of the top MSOs that are over a billion dollars in market cap. The top MSOs trade at a discount to the industry. When I extrapolate that, I don't know if that makes sense, but the reverse holds for Canada. What's up with that? I don't know. It's, it's not, I mean, the only thing I think of why Canada, one reason why, they're at a premium is because they're investor base. They have more institutions are able to invest in, the, you know, in um, the Canadian LPs because it's fairly legal. So you have more support, like you know, you know, you don't have, uh, you know, pension funds or whatever whipping these stocks around. They're holding them for a longer period. That might help, you know, some of the support the stock price. But by and large, it's not really. It doesn't make sense. But anyway, so that's my take this week on cash flow, and. <laughs> my green wave analysis i love it yeah i encourage everyone to take a look at it uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there um matt thanks for sharing that it's a, Thank you. yeah fascinating um the way some of this stuff just doesn't make sense uh, in some ways uh, and it's interesting now where we are because like 
four years or whatever. I don't I didn't know there was no public information. You know, it's kind of, you know, going in the dark here. Uh, there's state information. You could get some information from the states and may, many states are starting to provide more, you know, disclosures or whatever. But it's not the same as looking, you know, doing a deep dive into the company's filing. So anyway. Well, I think this is a great place to end. Um, you know, thanks for uh, joining the high rise. I did feel like that was a nice laid back, uh, data backed conversation <laughs> here. Um, thanks, Emily. Thanks, Matt. Uh, always so much to talk about. And I know um, next week we'll have even more uh, to discuss. I'm really looking forward to the Ascend um, headlines and seeing how that goes. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you both. Thank you. Thank you both. We'll see you next time. All right. Over and out.